Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Andrew Blauvelt, director of the Cranbrook Art Museum. Andrew has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. Thank you, Andrew, for joining us today. Thank you. So Cranbrook is so interesting. Talk about the founding of the Cranbrook educational community and, and then talk about the, the place of the museum within that community. Yes, it's a, it's a very unusual uh, institution and organization. Um, it was founded as a kind of utopian project by George Booth and Ellen Scripps Booth. Um, they were publishing magnets in Detroit um, at the turn of the last century. George was um, actually a craftsman before he was introduced into the newspaper industry by his wife's family, the Scripps family. Um, so he was very much interested in the arts and crafts movement, which was, of course, birthed in England in the late 1800s and came over to America in the early 1900s. And so Detroit was one of those cities like Boston that was very much interested in the arts and crafts movement. And they had a vision. They bought a farm. There was nothing really out in Bloomfield Hills at that time. Um, and then uh, slowly a community started to evolve around them. And they needed to have all of the... Um, you know, community assets that you would have when you started to build a community. So they first built a church, and then they, people started having kids, so they built an elementary school. The kids got older, they built a middle school, and a high school, and so on. Um, and so that's how the architecture of Cranbrook began to be developed. And they had met um, through their son, actually, who was studying architecture, had a professor, Eliel Saarinen, who was new to the United States. And, he was probably only famous to Americans because he, was, he won second prize in the uh, Chicago Tribune Tower competition. <laughs> uh, probably would have won first, but his entry was late. Um, and he introduced a kind of modernism uh, into America at that time and introduced that slowly into the Booth family. The Booths were interested, they were Anglophiles, so they were interested more in kind of a historic architecture. So the older buildings are more like very much like Hogwarts. You could film you know, Harry Potter there um, on the campus, and then the, the architecture gets more modern as the years go by. It's so interesting. People forget that at the turn of the century, in, in 1900, 1905, there were a number of different leaders of industry, captains of industry, who were thinking in idealized terms, what does a town actually look like? How do you create hospitable working conditions for workers? How do you ensure that workers can, can afford your products? Right. Educational opportunities, access to art, uh, li the, the libraries that, that mm -hmm. Carnegie uh, funded all over, the, the founding of, of Hershey, Pennsylvania. Right. Um, all those different ideas were encapsulated and, and Cranbrook really grew out of that movement. Yeah, it was very utopic, as I said. Um, you know, it was really a kind of a realizing a personal ambition that they had. So he basically imported a bunch of skilled craftsmen, including the master architect, L.L. Saren, and his family, to really build everything. So Cranbrook is one of the few places in the United States where you can witness a, um, a kind of total work of art and design. So they literally designed everything, the buildings, the wall coverings, the, uh, the cutlery, the plates, uh, every aspect of the environment was designed, and the whole campus was planned. And interesting, um, Saarinen was also a, a city planner, and that was kind of his claim to fame. So he helped do the, some of the original master plans of Helsinki. And so he brought that kind of to a microcosm on this 300-acre campus. Saarinen, would, you know, he would be a learning by doing person, right? You have to, um, and that's how you would learn, but in a very kind of um, more egalitarian, libertarian sense of like pedagogy, not um, the idea that the master craftsman has all the knowledge and simply transfers that verbatim to the student. So, there, but the Cranbrook, the Academy of Art, which the Art Museum is part of, still has this model. So it's one of the most radical graduate programs in the world in art. There's really nothing quite like it because there are no classes, no grades. There's only studio. You only make work and you only critique it. And that is, and you, and the artists live on campus, and they also have studios adjacent to the students' studios. So there's a proximity, but there's not the direct pedagogy that you would expect from this traditional master student or atelier kind of European model. And it also gives people the freedom to create something that they can, in retrospect, see was a complete mistake. Yes. It's, it's really about how you arrive at whatever conclusion you, as an artist, arrive at. 
right. It's kind of, uh, I call it you know, art school for grown-ups because it's not a, <laughs> the, the critiques can be brutal, and uh, the, but that's usually what artists, and very opinionated, very subjective, and you have to navigate, you have to learn to navigate advice and criticism and filter it constantly. Like, do I agree with what this person's saying? Do I not agree with what they're saying? Does this affect where I'm at? There's no clear model to follow except your own. So it's very scary. That's why I say it's the grown-up version of art school. How does that affect what you present at the museum? Mm -hmm. Because there yeah. you've got, again, you have this, this dialogue with the, with the school and with the rest of Cranbrook. Well, we try to encourage in the viewers the, um, the sense of openness and questioning that the students have as part of their daily experience. Are all uh, exhibits and works selected for exhibits, are they selected by an individual? A, a, do you have rotating uh, curatorial selections? How does this work? We do organize a lot of our own um, exhibitions. Lately we've been trying to kind of mine our own history and, and increasingly more the recent past. We were excited to discover a painting by MacArthur Binion who is, one of the, is the first African-American graduate of the painting department at Cranbrook. And um, he went off to New York, very talented, really interesting experiment in, um, at that time, abstraction. But then he introduces a lot of the biography into the work. And his career has been, um, he's, you know, of course, he's always been producing, but then, you know, rediscovered, in a sense, by the market. And so that also forces us to confront those issues of, of neglected histories. And we had a lot of students who came to Cranbrook who studied from international Right. Um, for a very long time, and the school is still very much international. Well, all those people didn't really stay in Michigan. They went back to their countries, and they also had impact there. So we're also constantly researching some of those figures, too. What happened to this person? So there's a painter in the Philippines. He's deceased now, but he's getting a lot of notoriety now because he helped introduce the aspects of abstraction in the Philippines in the post-war period. But he studied at Cranbrook, and that's where he developed those ideas. Interesting. Um, how did you find, you, you've been here for a little over a year, how did you find the transition from your role at the Walker and to be the director of this small museum? Yes, so, um, so Cranbrook is interesting because of that gap that I was talking about, that 20 mile gap between Detroit and, and Bloomfield Hills. And Detroit is actually a, you know, an emerging uh, contemporary art scene and market. It's very scrappy, yes. <laughs> um, in part because of the low cost of overhead there. Right. So it's become very attractive, and so the scene is starting to develop, but that's 20 miles away. So a lot of the programming that we're looking at now is really outreach programming to the communities in Detroit. And so you know, we finished a, a big project with Nick Cave, who's a Cranbrook alum, did a series of, we did an exhibition at the museum, but we also did a series of performances that are all around the city a city's vast, it's 100, almost 140 square miles, so there's many different communities. So anything that's more mobile, I think, is a better idea. And this is another big paradigm shift in the museum world, is that it's not just about your physical location, but it's, it's you have to take the art to people. It's a big movement, and that, that's counter to a lot of people's thinking. And it's okay if it just goes to the people. Yes. And this is where we have the interesting discussions with boards or, you know, did they have to come back? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Did they have the experience? You know? And with Cave, it's, it's arguable that if he's wearing the costumes and others are wearing the costumes, the amazing things that he creates, mm -hmm. and they're create, created to be worn and performed in. So if you actually see it in use, if you go to the museum, you can see it's static. But and if that's you see it I, in use, it's, it, it, it has I, I a different dimension. I would argue it's a superior experience, right? Right. So the superior experience was actually delivered <laughs> to the people in the community. In that case, it's an unusual case, but it's true. So projects like that, I think, are interesting that try to um, suture the physical location, the outreach portion to, into the community, and then how, does, how do you make art out of all of that? And, and then we can have the debates about, is it art? <laughs> With Cranbrook still being at the center of this grand experiment in, in educational ideas, the experience of art in life. Thank you so much, Andrew Blauvelt, for sharing with us your work at the Cranbrook Art Museum, and thank you so much for your insights. Well, thank you for having me.